Hello, Microbial Nation. John here. Before we begin the episode, I just want to let you know that we will be taking a month off, but don't worry. We're not forgetting the rest of biotourism. So keep in touch and wait till the next episode drops in one month. Until then, don't forget to love your microbes. See you soon. Welcome to the Micro Moment, that show that takes you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And I'm Julie. And today we continue our season uncovering the intriguing tales of historical bioterrorism that left an indelible mark on the course of civilization. In this episode, we delve into two chilling acts. We are going to unravel the unsettling tales of the Middle Ages when biological warfare took on new dimensions, from the catapulting of plague-infested bodies into besieged cities to the clandestine poisoning of water supplies. We'll uncover the shocking strategies employed to spread disease and terrorize adversaries. And we'll delve into the spine-chilling act of the Spanish mixing wine with the blood of leprosy patients to sell to their unsuspecting French foes. So naturally, I'm drinking some red wine for this episode. And if you like, and of course, if you're of age, please join me. And if you're not driving, don't drive and drink. That's bad. That's my first PCA of today. (laughs) And like last time, we will also call out some other acts of potential bioterrorism in this period up until Lee Wen Hook discovered the wonderful unseen world of microbiology. Prepare to embark on a journey through time and witness the dark power wielded by microscopic adversaries that forever shaped our world. And boy, did they. Boy, howdy. Did you say they put blood in wine and then sold it so they made money off it? Yes, um, it depends on whose version of the story that you read. There's actually not a lot of info on it. I've saw maybe two or three. I don't think I've read two things that were the same, but in some versions, they did sell it. I found the same thing. Like, I feel like it needs to be reiterated again. Like this, all of these stories are kind of subject to interpretation over the years and not great storytelling and and documentation so well arguably great storytelling but not great historical <laughs> facts yes yes that's a good clarification because it is a great story well i think it's kind of interesting because you would think that the alcohol would kill the microbe but it is microbacterium leprae, so I don't know if they die from alcohol, and also that's a lot less concentration than a lot of microbes are killed from. And they're, they're yeah, microbacterium are pretty hardy. Yeah, they can survive through a. Lot Sounds of stuff. like a nasty way, like to infect someone. I mean, definitely because like you drink wine to enjoy it and to relax, and then next thing you know, you have leprosy. That's no joke. That's a slow disease too. Oh yeah. But we're not getting straight into that. First, I think we have a couple stories before we're going to get into the Spaniards and the French. And we even have one before we get into the plague. Before the plague, we have the story of Barbarossa. The year is 1155, and a figure known as Barbarossa casts a dark shadow over Tortona, Italy. Using water as his medium... He poisons wells with the bodies of deceased victims, leaving devastation and fear in his wake. So wait, this is like a legitimate person that's going around poisoning? I don't think he's going around and poisoning just any wells. It was the wells of his foes. Again, this is something that has sort of been fabricated through history and has still survived the course of time through the stories that we have. How real it is, I don't know. But I would say that as far as bioterrorism acts go, I think it is very believable to think that people of this time frame would take diseased bodies, know that diseased bodies would cause harm to other people, and could definitely infiltrate water systems and cause a vast amount of sickness. And no offense to anyone, but I'm sorry, Barbarossa does sound like a nefarious name. It does. Sounds like a pirate. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know if he was a pirate. He was in Italy. Italy has a lot of... I mean, there's a lot of trade there. There's a lot of pi- trade. Every country I, had pirates. He could have been a pirate. All right. A century later brings us perhaps the most well-known and most accepted first account of true bioterrorism. Last time we talked about two accounts that happened BCE. A lot of historians believe that those were true bioterrorism events. A lot do not. This one, however, that we're going to get into is more well accepted as a true bioterrorism event. However, there are still several historians and microbiologists and epidemiologists that don't believe the story is true. Just put a pin in it. And so we will get into the plague. Julie, take it away. All right. Before we get started, I cannot think about this particular mechanism without thinking of one of my very favorite movies and one of my very favorite scenes. So only cool people are going to get this. But I want you guys to think about in this movie, King Arthur is seeking for the Holy Grail and he comes across a castle and there are some obnoxious French people in there. And this guy is known as the French taunter. Do you guys remember this scene? Oh, yeah. yeah. I grew up on this. So after hurling a lot of insults at uh, King Arthur, do you remember what happens next? I mean, a lot of things happen. Well, yeah, a lot of things happen. But before the rabbit? Before the rabbit happens, yes. But it does involve animals, so you're kind of close. There's a there's a little raspberry, a little... Yes, he does do the tapping on his head and... <laughs> but there is catapulting involved, I know that. There, Yes, exactly, that's what I'm getting at. Of a cow, right? Yes, that is the first thing that they catapult out, and it's hilarious because the whole way of the catapult so they show like a live cow you know being brought out and then the next thing you hear is and (laughs) the cow lands on one of the i'm using air quote horses which is a guy with coconut shells right everybody with me yep yep following yep the graphics were top notch at the time oh yes and so then a series of Animals in all kinds of shapes and states of aliveness are hurled over the castle wall. There's definitely a chicken. Yeah, there's a cacophony of sound. There's <laughs> There are cats meowing and oh, yeah. sheeps bleeding as all of these animals are thrown over the wall. And King Arthur then has enough. And they attack the castle walls with their swords. To no avail. Right. And the the animals keep flying down and they decide to do what? Anybody remember what they do? Retreat. Run run away. Run away. So for all the cool people out there, what you'll what you think of when you think of a catapult. That's what I think of is the first cow coming over the side of the wall after the French taunter gives all those insults to King Arthur and they throw all the animals over and King Arthur retreats. So this story that we're talking about, the year was 1346, so a long time ago, and it was a city called Kaffa. And Kaffa is actually now Ukraine. And there was a battle going on between the Tartar Mongols and the Genoese. And so they had been having this siege for a long time. And they were kind of at this stalemate, right? Nothing was happening. But what happened was, and and this, you know, some people will sort of argue about how this started, but the uh, Mongols started losing their soldiers to an illness. And they were dying by some accounts by the thousands per day, which is obviously going to put a pretty big kink in your siege when your soldiers start dying. Yeah, it's a lot of soldiers. It's a lot of soldiers. And you can imagine that, you know, they didn't have the sanitation that we have today. You know, there was no, you know, local crematorium that they could burn up these bodies or, you know, they're in the middle of a war. They don't have the things that you might have in peacetime. So what to do with all of these bodies? They're stinking up the place and people are getting sicker and uh, more and more people are dying. So someone, and I'd like to sort of not know who that person was, decided, hey, 
why don't we start catapulting these guys over the wall because we don't want to smell them anymore. And so over the wall into Kaffa, the bodies went. And at that time, they didn't have, you know, the word of the, you know, the plague or any of that. They just knew that people were getting sick and they were dying and that seemingly people were contracting it from each other. They didn't really understand the mechanisms of that. But they decided, hey, let's throw them all over the wall because we basically don't want to smell them anymore, I think was probably the number one reason for sending them over. So is that bioterrorism? Well, it turns out that it was because they sent them over the wall. And lo and behold, the city of Kaffa now had all these dead bodies that they needed to dispose of. And they're like in their walled city. So they now had the job of getting rid of all of these bodies and everything was smelly and the air was polluted, the water was polluted with all of these dead bodies. And guess what started to happen? Everyone got sick. People started getting sick. I like can never imagine, I try to imagine what it must have smelled like back then, but I just don't think that anyone alive could have any idea of what it smelled like back then. Yeah. I mean, it probably smelled bad already, right? Right. No, all the time. No one bathed. No one bathed. Everyone just pooped everywhere, right? They were still like putting their poop out in the street and... Probably into their drinking water, too. Into their drinking water. No one bathed. They were like sleeping with goats and chickens and... But the smell of a dead body, I think, like it's a unique smell. And I think a freshly dead body smells like... Not that great, but one that's been decomposing for a little while, probably even less great. So, yeah, I just think we have no no idea what that must smell like, because when we have dead bodies, they're like immediately preserved and immediately put into certain dressed in a certain way. So they're not going to smell. I think the only people I would know is those that are doing wellness checks. Oh, yeah, they probably do now. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring down the episode. No, no, that's that's kind of it's kind of. Well, we're we're trying to keep it light, but you know, there's only so much you can do because it must have just been, you know, it's outside of our imagination, right? And I'm glad it's outside of our imagination. Mm-hmm. I am. Me too. Grateful. I only have to try to imagine what that smells like. Yeah, and you can debate how we have distanced ourselves from death in modern society, but. I don't think anybody would argue that people need to get that close to death anymore. Yeah. Also grateful for that. Yeah. So it turns out that while it did debilitate the forces that were inside the city of Kaffa and probably also didn't help the citizens of Kaffa because now they started dying and the whole point of the siege was to take the city over. But now you've kind of made it a city you don't really want anymore, right? Because you have now poisoned it, polluted it, and given it the plague. So turns out, and this is the the Black Plague caused by Yersinia pestis, um, was spread. And of course, this is in the area of Ukraine. And eventually, the plague would spread over Europe and kill, what, 25 million people? They say a third of the population, right, of Europe? Yeah. I can never remember because I know there's like, what, two big Black Plagues? I, for some reason, I can't differentiate the two in my head. I think this is the big one. This is the big one? And I think it kind of rolled across Europe several times, right? And right. so some people argued, you know, that this was the way that it spread. But most people say, you know, this is certainly one way that, you know, it infected more people because they spread the Yersinia pestis, you know, over the wall to Kappa. But it's probably not the only way, right? You had rats coming in on ships with fleas. And I was reading pretty interesting studies, the way that they're like, well, the rats probably wouldn't have gone that far away from their nests. And so, yeah, it would probably, it probably was the bodies being catapulted, but, you know, likely we'll never know exactly how it was spread, but you can imagine that catapulting dead bodies, dead rotting bodies that died from disease. I I would say that that's probably a pretty surefire vector that probably decimated that city at that time. At least some disease, yeah. Yeah. Like what we were saying, cadavers are just filled with diseases. Right, and they're not just going to leave the corpses. Python will care, but their lawyers might. They get infected and they spread to other people. Probably burn them and 
that could be a potential way to spread it to other people. Yeah. Well, I mean, even in this day and age, you know, we still don't know exactly what happened. And we never will. Yeah. I mean, we, we'll never know exactly what happened. And, and of course, this was a long, long time ago. But the way that people, you know, kind of can trace the genetic makeup of some of this, I don't, that's beyond my imagination, but they are able to kind of trace some of these strains of the plague, you know, went. So they did it on purpose for sure. You know, were they trying to spread the disease? I'm not sure if they had quite that understanding, but they certainly felt like they were going to cause, you know, issues for their enemies. But did they really win the war? I would argue that they did not. I kind of feel like if I wasn't super into environmental microbiology, ecology, I would probably do this epidemiology of ancient DNA. It is pretty interesting. And and you think, that you know, once, be... once it happens one time, you know, people are going to be like, hey, did you hear what they did in Kappa? And, you know, likely there are episodes where this happened and there isn't a story about it because it never did get reported. But There was another instance of plague bodies being catapulted, and that was in 1710. 1710? 1710. Wow, that's so recent. That was not that long ago. Yeah. Well, and some people will say that there is no proof that this happened, but there are some people that theorize that the Russian troops did, in fact, catapult bodies Uh, into Swedish cities in 1710. But it's debated. And how are we, you know, who's ever going to prove or disprove it? So that's true. I mean, if this is very controversial, but if they were to exhume the bodies of the corpse of that time, they could probably try to see if there is Yersinia pestis. Yeah, but then they'd have to also figure out whether or not they catapulted them over something. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm -hmm. And maybe they got the whole idea from Barbarossa, who took cadavers and poisoned waterways. Mm. A conniving Barbarossa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it goes back a long way. So again, that's the year of the Kaffa catapulting was 1346. So I think it's pretty interesting to think that, you know, they might not have had the full scope of what they were doing, but I guess sort of the evil mind to make that happen. I feel like you don't often need to understand mechanisms of destruction to use them, but Humans that want to cause harm can figure out ways to obtain things to cause harm. Yeah. I guess I always think of like when I think of bioterrorism, like that it's scientists and really, really smart people that are figuring out how to disguise it or distribute it or hide it or get it to where it needs to go. At least that's how all the movies look now. But these guys didn't have movies to uh, emulate. They just came up with this all on their lonesome. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of scary. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, bombs, right? Like, no one knows how to build a bomb. No one knows the mechanism behind your cinea pestis. But you know that if you have one in your hand, you can cause destruction. Yep. Right. Yep. So that is my story about catapulting bodies over the wall at Kappa to spread the Black Death. What an image. Another catapulting thing I always think of that kind of horrified me as a movie in The Return of the King when they catapult the heads of the soldiers into the city there. And like, oh, yeah, like when you first see them, they just kind of look like, you know, stones or rock. But then when they landed, you see that they're actually heads Mm. and probably carrying diseases. Yeah, probably. Was it the retreating of the Mongolian like force that caused the spread of the plague or was it? The city that caused like I think they kind of argue about it because a lot of people will be like, okay, well, it came in on ships that had, you know, like ships would come in with all of the crew dead and, you know, rats and were come off the ships and that would spread it to like these port cities and then people would travel. And like we talked about, like it, the plague kind of rolled through in several different waves. So I think this was this is one way. And then there are, I think, probably lots of other ways. Whether or not, once it got established, it just rolled across Europe. Right. Yeah, so Julie, do you have anything else for us? No, that was pretty much pretty much it. Just to leave you with that image of dead bodies flinging through the air and landing wherever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yikes. Not a good thought. Yeah. So I have a little segment that kind of ties into what you just talked about and what I talked about in the previous episode. So if you haven't listened to the previous episode, go back and listen to that. 
where we talked a little bit about the plague of Athens, which was caused by anthrax. And I alluded a little bit to how these two pathogens, Yersinia pestis and Bacillus anthracis, share a number of different qualities and therefore may have been both happening at the same time of the big black death. So Yersinia pestis and Bacillus anthracis are similar in a lot of ways. Both are feared as bioterrorism agents with the capability of wiping out large portions of the population. We saw Bacillus anthracis wipe out a third of the population of Athens during the plague of Athens in 430 BC. We see Yersinia pestis wiping out a third of the population of Europe during the Black Plague years. So both are very capable bioterrorism agents. Both are primarily animal diseases that can make the leap into humans in a very deathly way. For Yersinia pestis, the agent is a flea. And Yersinia pestis actually starves the flea in a way or makes the flea so thirsty that it just continuously bites and bites and bites and bites. And so it's always thirsty but can never have its thirst quenched no matter how much blood it's drinking. Yeah, I feel bad for fleas, like the way it does this. I know, it's like the one story that you're like, man, poor flea. It's the only instance where you're like, poor flea. So like, what happens is Yersinia pestis forms a biofilm at some point from their mouth to their stomach. And so a flea will bite something and try to eat, but it's not getting to their stomach. So what happens is they end up throwing up into the wound causing Yersinia pestis to go to the person, but they can never eat, so they end up starving to death. Diabolical. Yeah. It's mm. crazy. For Bacillus anthracis, it's not quite so diabolical. They're not quite starving fleas, but they are infecting livestock, typically sheep and cattle. Both cause skin lesions. Both can kill the host when they enter into the bloodstream, which causes sepsis, which, I mean, fundamentally, a lot of microbes, if they cause sepsis, will end up leading to death. That is how my grandfather died. This can be true for a lot of different microbes. In the case of my grandfather, it was a multidrug-resistant E. coli strain. Today, we know Yersinia pestis as a gram-negative bacteria, while anthrax is a gram-positive bacteria. And so this is where they start to separate in sort of their mechanisms of bioterrorism agents and their mechanisms in causing disease. So a gram-positive bacteria, which anthrax is, has a thicker cell wall. Typically, gram-positive bacteria with this thicker cell wall are more susceptible to beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin, which we will probably be doing an episode on penicillin because I have taken a deep dive into that rabbit hole once more. And I have so many new facts to share with everyone on penicillin. She spent so many hours researching the discovery of penicillin. It's crazy. Yeah, I think in the last two weeks, I've read something like 700 pages. And worked a full-time job, which is absurd. This is how much I love what I do. Back to anthrax and Yersinia pestis. Anthrax is generally hardier uh, than Yersinia pestis. It can form those tough protective spores that we talked about last time. It forms those endospores. Yersinia pestis cannot. So those endospores allows anthracis or bacillus anthracis to live outside of a host for a much longer time, whereas Yersinia pestis has to find its host pretty rapidly before it just dies. And finally, what makes anthrax a slightly more potent bioterrorism agent is that it produces a toxin while Yersinia pestis does not. So Yersinia pestis, it just kind of comes to a certain population within the host. The host has its own immune system that's going to be activated and eventually that overwhelms the host and causes deaths. Anthrax will do that too. Bacillus anthracis will do that as well. But it also has this added toxin, which we will discuss in further detail as we move through history and talk about other times where anthrax was used as a bioterrorist agent. So I just want to throw on that little tidbit comparing those two. Sorry I didn't include, what was yours, tularemia? Oh, I do have a little sidebar about the Hittite Empire. Hittites. So one of the articles I read... I couldn't tell if they were trying to say if the Hittite plague was this or not, or if it ran concurrently with the Telaremia plague that was occurring. But 
that skirmish skirmish war that they had with the Egyptian Empire, they took prisoners, and those prisoners brought a disease with them that hit the Hittite Empire. So the Hittite Empire may have had two plagues hitting them at the same time. What was the second plague? It may have been Yersinia pestis. They found bodies that had Yersinia pestis in it. Mm. So it sounds like they were just going back and forth with each other's plague between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Like, yeah. Here's our plague donkeys. And they're like, here's our plague prisoners. And they're like, here's our plague rams. Yeah. So like they may have, in fact, have had a double whammy in terms of diseases going at the same time. Wow. That's vile. Interesting to think if they like hadn't gone to war with each other. Would all of these plagues have been a little more contained or maybe not have happened at all if people were not traveling for war? And then what would overpopulation be like today if we didn't wipe up a third of the population every hundred years, every thousand years? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I just like, you know, overpopulation would be so much worse. Yeah, if there was no plagues, period. Yeah. It's tragic. 100% tragic, but. Are we due for another plague, do you think? We just had one. I, yeah, did it really d- reduce our population, though? I mean, a lot of people died. It, a lot of people died. It changed our social dynamic for sure. Mm-hmm. Definitely did that. I think we're still feeling the ripple effect of what the pandemic has in store for all of us. But we did not lose a third of our population. No, and I don't think that we will. I mean, I don't want to say this and jinx humanity, but I don't think that we will ever lose a third of our population as humans from biological warfare. Do you think it's because uh, our knowledge of microbes has come so far that we'd be able to figure something out in time? Yeah, and I think there are a lot more people trying to do good in the world than perhaps that one person who's trying to be a bioterrorist And I think it's um, with all the people trying to do good and all the people studying vaccines and all the people studying microbiology, they're bound to outpace whatever pathogen comes next. I will say also in kind of modern times, like in my EMT book, when I was taking the EMT course, there is like a chapter, maybe not a chapter, but like five or six pages of the book that are dedicated to the like anthrax and Uh, some of the other things that we've been talking about as far as like these things are still around and we still need to be aware of them. Really? Yep. Yeah, I think it's one of those things like it's just so terrifying that people need to know about it, but it's probably a very rare instance that it's ever going to happen. Like even as we go through history, we're going to see that it doesn't happen that frequently except for World War II, which that's going to be a trip when we get there. It's going to be a dark trip. Yeah, but people still get anthrax from the environment. People still get the Black Plague. Right. And that's why you don't hug prairie dogs, no matter how cute they are in the wild. Right. Prairie dogs are not <laughs> regular dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Don't put a leash on them. Don't take I, them. I will admit they are adorable looking, but don't. Very do cute it. from afar. Exactly. Yes, and they don't like to be hugged either. No. So. Mm, most, most wild animals do not. Sort of like bison in the in Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. There's no don't hug them. Second PSA of today. <laughs> yes. Don't hug wild animals. Don't do drugs. Don't drink and drive. Three. Words to live by. <laughs> All right, let's get back to history of bioterrorism. Yeah. After that little deviation, let's get back to it. <laughs> Hope y'all enjoyed that. We have a few more supposed acts of bioterrorism to go through. Moving forward to the year 1422, the Lithuanian army takes bioterrorism to gruesome heights. They craft manure made from infected victims and launch it into the town of, I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Karolstein, Bohemia, spreading disease and horror among their enemies. Gross. Oh, the horror. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's shift our focus to the late 15th century. We're getting pretty close to Lewin Hook and his microscope, but we're not quite there yet. So in the 15th century, in the grim depths of human history, an act of unspeakable horror emerged in 1495, which was three years after Columbus sailed the ocean blue, or so goes the rhyme. 
As the Spanish delved into the darkest realms of bioterrorism to gain the upper hand over their French adversaries. As the conflict raged between these rival nations, a diabolical plan took shape, forever staining the annals of warfare. The Spanish, known for their cunning tactics, devised a plan so sinister it would make your blood run cold if we haven't done that yet. They turned to an unexpected source— A group shunned by society, the leprosy patients. These afflicted souls, already burdened with their own suffering, became pawns in a wicked game of warfare. This doesn't sound good. No, not at all. The Spanish, driven by their insatiable thirst for victory, concocted a heinous elixir that defied all sense of humanity. They mixed the very blood of leprosy patients with their prized wine, creating a toxic blend that would bring not only defeat, but also a fate worse than death to their French adversaries. And again, when I was reading the various blogs and papers and books on this particular instance in bioterrorism, some said the Spanish sold this wine to the French that was soiled with leprosy blood. Others said that they would leave casks of wine behind as they were retreating for the French to find and then drink the casks that were left behind. You know, the French and their wines. Right. They knew that they were going to drink. I mean, who would not? Free wine. I mean, I would. I I wouldn't say no to free wine. Exactly. Little did they know it was not just wine that they were getting. As the tainted wine flowed freely into the French goblets, an invisible horror took hold. The unsuspecting drinkers, enticed by the rich color and enticing aroma, were oblivious to the lurking danger within. The blood of the afflicted cursed through their veins, spreading its sinister payload with every sip. Soon, the French found themselves gripped by a terrifying affliction, their bodies ravaged by the merciless disease. They withered away under its unforgiving grip. The Spanish had unleashed a biological weapon of unparalleled cruelty, a chilling act of bioterrorism that surpassed all moral boundaries. Leprosy. And what I think is really interesting, but I don't necessarily think that there is much of a connection. But the 1490s was also when Europe became afflicted by another disease, which would wreak havoc to Europe for hundreds of years up through World War I, World War II. Do you know what it is? Hmm. This is also a deep dive that we've done on the micro moment, and I think we've done at least three podcasts on it. Really? I think so. We've at least mentioned it in a dozen podcasts. This is a big microbe in changing the history of humans. Hold on. I'm thinking here. We've also named this microbe the Queen of Corellia. Do you remember what she looked like? Oh, wait. I do know what it is now. It's syphilis. Syphilis. Syphilis came to Europe in the 1490s. Whether it was Columbus bringing it back Or perhaps it was caused by this blood in the wine. I don't think so. But it is a theory. Hmm. 1490, syphilis started to pop up in Europe quite rapidly and would spread basically every time anyone had any sort of wars where some wandering soldiers might find their way into particular houses with ladies of the night. Syphilis would outbreak. A house of ill repute. A house of ill repute, as they were once called. Um, but anyways, the story is not about syphilis. It is about leprosy. So what did this unsuspecting French go through in contracting leprosy? It was not pretty. I think everyone has some sort of idea of what leprosy looks like. But leprosy, or Henson's disease, as it was sometimes called, because Henson was the one who discovered Microbacterium leprae, which is the causal agent of leprosy. Mycobacterium is a genus of bacteria that causes a number of intense and history-changing diseases, foremost tuberculosis. And like tuberculosis, treatment today is available for leprosy, but it's quite intensive and involves a concoction of antibiotics for a prolonged amount of time. They are not easy to get rid of if you're infected with them. 
They are very difficult once you contract it. Leprosy is spread with prolonged and close contact with someone with untreated leprosy and can take many months before it is contracted, which actually makes it a less viable bioterrorism agent because of how long it takes to transmit. It's not like you are on the subway with someone who has leprosy and then you're going to have you're going to start having this disease. Right. Say in terms that's probably low in the totem pole for like bioterrorism use. Right. But if you put the blood of someone who has leprosy into wine, well, who knows? Very true. You're playing the long game there. That's a much different story. Leprosy has been with humanity for a very long time. The earliest evidence we have of the disease comes from skeletal remains from India, 2000 BCE. So it's been a pathogen of humans for a very long time, unlike some of the other pathogens that we're talking about, which are primarily zoonotic in their nature. Lepers were often sent off to live in their own colonies and were shunned by society. I have to say, like, it was interesting that multiple civilizations did this. Yes. That were not in contact with each other. Mm-hmm. So, like, when we went to Hawaii, we found out one of the islands in Hawaii, they shipped off all their lepers to that island and their family members over there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or they just send them off in boats and be like, good luck. Bye. Yeah. Um, they were very cruel to this population. And a lot of it was because the symptoms were so disfiguring. It was very evident when you had leprosy. And it was not something that anybody wanted to be around for a long time in history. They didn't understand what it was. They just understand you were different. And humans hate things that are different from them. We see that again and again through history. When something is different, violence occurs Hmm. for whatever reason. Or at least cruelty. Or, yes, definitely cruelty, Um, which is really unfortunate for any people that are different from the status quo. I think we're doing a lot better than we were during this time period, but we're still not quite there yet. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Symptoms of leprosy include discolored patches of the skin, thick, stiff, or dry skin, painless ulcers, loss of eyebrows or eyelashes, which is a symptom I've never heard of before with any pathogen I've ever studied, which has quite a lot. Nerve damage that can cause paralysis, especially in the hands and feet. Eye problems that may lead to blindness. And I do hate eye problems. Just like one of those things. Like I think I can handle a lot of like, I don't know, dissections and bloody and gruesome things. But it comes to the eyes, I don't know. I think it's it's just such a sensitive area that we end up like sympathizing or we like put ourselves in a situation. You can feel the pain when you see it like... And it's just like, oof, which is why like lobotomies. I'm like, why did anyone decide that was a thing we should do? Why? No. Anyways, this is not a psychology podcast. If untreated, leprosy can progress into crippling of the hands and feet, shortening of the toes and fingers, which I also thought was really interesting. Chronic non-healing ulcers that would stay around for a long period of time. And of course, disfigurement, um, mostly around the nose, which is also something that we see in syphilis. And we get the involvement of the nose clubs. Microbacterium leprae is an interesting bacteria because it has a small set of protein coding genes and a lot of pseudogenes, a part of it. So it has a smaller active genome, I guess is one way that you can say it. It's an intracellular pathogen and relies on the host cell for survival and replication, much like a virus. It's not a virus. It's definitely a bacterium. But unlike a lot of bacterium, it's not very good at being a free-living cell. It doesn't live on its own very easily. It needs a host. Right. And there are some examples that we've covered in previous episodes of other microbes that do that as well. Like what? I think, uh, what is it? Wolbachia. That's an interesting. That's true. Yeah, on, Wolbachia. On the episode that we, we covered recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was two episodes ago. Yep. So besides humans, armadillos and red squirrels are often hosts of this microbacterium species. Can I say like a, a kind of a morbid thing? 
of we've been saying kind of morbid things for the past hour. <laughs> Go right. ahead. So this is this actually involves like an Irish song that I like. An Irish song? Yes, an Irish song. That has to do with leprosy? Yes. Do I know it? Uh, I feel like I, I know I did, it. I did show it to you once. So it's this person's pretty much drinking because of all their family and friends have passed away. Mm -hmm. And one of the lyrics is, my uncle said he was a leprechaun, but he's actually a leper and his arms or legs are gone. Aww. <laughs> you say, ah, and I laugh. What's, what does that mean? That I have more empathy than you. <laughs> and I, I can see where she gets her dark humor from. <laughs> <laughs> Weird Al Yankovic also has a song called Party at the Leper Colony. Oh, does he? I don't think he ever sings that song, but he did <laughs> make that song. <laughs> Anyways, we are coming to the end of the second episode on bioterrorism. And all of these stories echoes the gruesome events, which we cannot fully confirm, but we do know they forever haunt the pages of history. This banishes twisted scheme driven by desperation and ruthlessness marked a somber milestone in the evolution of warfare. It stands as a reminder of humanity's capacity for darkness, where even the most vulnerable among us can become unwitting agents of destruction and often are up until recent days when I think we've become a little bit more woke and understanding of other people. As we enter the 17th century, we encounter a disturbing strategy employed by the Polish army. And this one I think is very disturbing, but I also think is very probable. In a bizarre and chilling act, the Polish fire saliva from rabid dogs toward their enemies, hoping to infect them with the deadly rage of rabies. Is this like arrows tipped with saliva? Yes. I mean, we're in, what, the 1600s? So, yeah, we're probably still talking arrows, maybe bullets. Very crude, probably rifles at that time. Yeah. So, once again, as we just reflect on these chilling chapters in our collective history, as it is very collective, we've touched upon a number of countries and cultures in the past two episodes, let us not forget the horrifying consequences that arise from such acts of bioterrorism. May these tales serve as a haunting reminder of the depths to which mankind can sink when driven by fear and the pursuit of power. And let us also remember in acts of bioterrorism, the microbes are not the villains, but yet another victim being manipulated by the evil minds throughout human history. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please rate and subscribe as it really helps the show out. Stay tuned for our next episode where we unravel bioterrorism events in the time between microbes being discovered in 1676, and the Spanish flu, which would be 1918. Remember, the smallest things can hold immense and devastating power. Until then, feed your microbes. Feed your guts. Make your microbes love you lots. Bye. Bye. Bye.